Hello and welcome to today's Daily Bible Reading. We are in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18, looking at Hezekiah, and then we continue through Acts of, the Epistle, uh, Acts of the Apostles. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word gives us the roadmap for life. Your word gives us the food for the journey, and your word brings us into a relationship with you so I pray, Lord, that today we would enjoy that a roadmap, food, and a closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is 2 Kings chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Neshutan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him nor among those who were before him, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord had commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him wherever he went, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaras, and the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the washer's field. And when they called for the king, there came out to them Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you two thousand horses if you are able, on your part, to set riders on them. 
How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah, within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall, who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, which would have been Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sevapham, Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. So here we, we see the interaction between Hezekiah, his, his, at least his administrators, and the, the Rabshakeh the, the, from the delegation from the, the king of Assyria. And the delegation from Assyria are treating God in, in a way that just diminishes God as merely a territorial God, no greater than any other supposed territorial God. And we're going to see God defends his own reputation, but that'll come up next. And so we see the Rabshakeh speaking in Hebrew and the men on the wall, the, the, the administrators for the king, saying, no, speak to us in, in Aramaic. We understand that. And after the exile, when Judah is ultimately running ahead in the story, when Judah is taken to Babylon, they come back and essentially Aramaic becomes their language, actually. So by the time of Christ, Jews spoke largely spoke Aramaic as well. The priests and so on would have spoken Hebrew as well. Right, we come now to Acts. Acts chapter. We're going to look at Acts 19 and 20. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. 
I just want to pause here and I want you to just reflect on the fact or consider the fact that Paul, his normal modus operandi was to go into a synagogue and teach the, the local Jewish community there. In this instance, Ephesus, it appears, didn't have one. So he went essentially what would have been to the river and he found 12 men there. Now, uh, this, this was a custom among Jews scattered around the empire the, that they would go to the local river and that's how they knew where to meet and they would basically form a, a synagogue without a building, essentially. And then Paul goes into what we, we might consider today a Bible school, the school of Tyrannus, the, the reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. And so from there, it says over the next two years, everyone in Asia was touched by the gospel. Quite an amazing effort. So we just think how the gospel is spread. Paul used every means available to him, whether it be a synagogue, whether it be a school or a hall or whatever. That, that's what he used. And let's think of what the principles today might be. Maybe it's exactly what we're doing now. We continue verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. So again, note it says that God was doing extraordinary miracles. So sometimes we read something like that and go, aha, uh -huh, that's what, that's, uh, that's how it works. You, you can heal people by sending them one of your handkerchiefs that you've prayed on. Well, you could and God may. But in this instance, this was extraordinary. In other words, not normal, which is in essence the, the, the nature of a miracle itself. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theatre, dragging with them Gaius, Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theatre. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defence to the crowd. 
But when they recognised that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in a regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Chapter 20 After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, notice that, that's Sunday, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive. And were not a little comforted. But going ahead of the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos, and the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, so he said to them, now I just want to point out that's on the coast, so he's called for the Ephesian elders to come from Ephesus over to the coast to to Miletus where he is. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. 
I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day and night to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. And this is Paul really really saying goodbye because he would we know as we track through Acts he will go to Jerusalem and that will begin his journey to Rome. He will go to Rome, he will be imprisoned, and it says that he would be imprisoned for the book the book of Acts closes, saying he was imprisoned at that point for two years. And we know that shortly after that he would be released to stand before Nero and Nero would order him to be beheaded. He would be taken down to a coastal town in Italy and there beheaded. Um, so that's, that's what's coming up. So no wonder they were sad that he had said that, that they would never see his face again. Interesting that Paul went by land, certain part of that journey, and scholars believe he did that because uh, he knew that, um, that that was a way of diverting perhaps a possible attack against him. And uh, uh, requesting the elders to come to Miletus, Again, it, it prevented him going into Ephesus and maybe getting delayed there. He really wanted to get to Jerusalem in time. And as it turns out, he got there just in time as well. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the God of just in time. You are the God who gives us wisdom, who guides our steps. And I pray for those who particularly now are looking for your wisdom and direction, that they would receive it and you would give it and that they would hear your voice. Thank you, Lord, for each one who's joined with me in this daily Bible reading. I pray that you bless them and bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining with me in this daily Bible reading. And if you haven't yet given it a thumbs up, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. If you're not yet a subscriber, firstly, you need to join YouTube. And if you're already a subscriber, don't need to subscribe again if you want to subscribe. But if you have just joined YouTube or if you haven't yet, please join YouTube and then hit subscribe and you'll get the daily notifications of these videos. God bless you, and you'll see me tomorrow.